Um, so what I'm going to, it's been interesting listening this morning, um, particularly with Kate's presentation, because it made me quite pleased. I thought, oh, that's good, that's all the stuff we've been saying. <laughs> so um, at least I'm telling people that's what they're meant to be doing. Let's hope it's translating into practice. So um, what I'm going to cover just in about 10 minutes or so is just thinking about how the information we've been talking about that's gathered with young people is used when we're having supervision meetings and how we use that to use that as a sort of feedback loop to consider what that's telling us about how the therapy's going and how that might influence subsequent sessions. Um, and also I've, I've, I've put in thinking about it in terms of um, team meetings as well because I'm really very conscious, particularly for IPTA, this, the, this year has been the first year um, where this has been one of the this is the modality has been available this year. So the trainees who are coming through the course are very much at the forefront of taking that into their services, and they may be the only person in the building who knows anything about this. So when you're trying to make that leap from one person developing their own clinical skills to a team starting to think about that as a as an option that's available, part of a the transformation and part of a care pathway there's quite a big responsibility sitting on these individual shoulders. So just thinking about some of the feedback we've got, how might that um, um, be assisted? And so um, the first thing um, that came to mind for me was just about case selection. and How do we identify the young people for whom this might be an option? Um, and so there are some things that are reasonably straightforward that we can think about. So we know that the recommendation is as IPT for a treatment for moderate to severe depression. Now that in itself, just knowing that it has that specific application is, is really quite important to share um, across the team, but it's also one of the clinical tasks we have in supervision of checking and using the ROMs to make sure that we are targeting and making this available to the young people who might benefit from it. So. Um, a couple of examples come to mind. Somebody came for interview um, this week to be on the course next year, and all the way through interview, she was saying to me, so for young people with anxiety and depression, and I was thinking, no, for young people with depression, and was kind of nudging her towards that in my feedback. And there was that loop was going around and thinking that would be one of the things we would want to clarify because actually we may be in, in danger of doing young people a disservice by giving them a therapy for which there's no evidence base, so we're not playing out that principle. Um, another one of my trainees um, on another, another course um, really has struggled to identify um, young people who would sort of meet the profile that we've set out um, and the, the criteria that we've set. And I had a fascinating but, but tricky conversation with his manager after this had rolled on for some months and his manager fed back to us and said, when he came on the course, we knew that we saw young people with moderate to severe depression. We now realise actually we don't. We see young people with mild depression. And so there was a mismatch there, a genuine one. Now that kind of scoring that one up to success for CYPI app that we now know, bit of a difficult journey for that trainee to go through for several months, having to carry the stress of not being able to, to match those, the criteria together. So knowing what's recommended and thinking about how we make sure that young people who are presenting with those kinds of difficulties have access there. That being said, we're not saying this in a very naive way that there's going to be, in fact, any, if, if uh, certainly not plenty, but if any young people who turn up and that's all that's going on, they're going to come along with complex, difficult problems. And so using something like the ARCADS to provide an overview and think about the, the, the range of different um, problems and difficulties that the young people are grappling with to, to try and look to see how depression might sit within that and how this therapy might serve that. So that becomes part of the discussion you would want to have within supervision as well as within the, the team meetings of thinking about that care pathway developing. So we know that, um, as was identified, once you get through all of the data and you get to that very nice, beautiful, simple diagram there that says, here's a line, if it's over it, have a think about this. If it's under it, maybe not so relevant. Um, then we can make use of that kind of feedback to say it's the young people who push ahead of, of that line in terms of depression. That being said, the, there may be more than one of those columns across the line. And so that becomes a basis of thinking, how are you making that decision with the young person to think what's meaningful for you to try and target? Where might be the entry 
into this, this piece of work and, and would that make sense for you? Um, my hope is that that would also be something that the team through discussion and being able to use reference to that kind of criteria might be able to start thinking collectively about not just who's on the, the, the IPTA therapist holding responsibility for finding that young person, um, but that the team think about that as an option for, for young people presenting in this way because assessments may happen um, across the, the team. The, the organisation of that differs enormously service to service. Um, if, if you only get this modality because it's delivered by the person who's conducting your assessment, there's something that's not working within the system as well as it could. The important thing though I think is we give guidelines here, what we're not trying to say is that the ROMs will replace clinical judgement. There has to be thinking and discussion about how to more systematically, more clearly gather this information and then use the expertise you've got to make a decision with support and guidance with the young person about what's going to be in their interest. The huge advantage, again, the complexity that you were describing of having a young person's version and, and parents' version um, is, I think, uh, um, something that we can capitalise on a great deal. So having more than one perspective on what the difficulties are um, isn't, isn't a problem when there's a, dif a difficulty. It's very valuable clinical information. And within this model, then carers or parents are routinely involved either at the assessment phase when the formulation is, is made and agreed, um, working through the process of therapy and at the end to think about what comes next. And so the, the relational focus of this therapy means that when the same measure is completed from a different perspective, that's almost invaluable information that, that we can make use of. And it can start to help us to think about, in, in supervision um, and with the young person, what might be going on if, in fact, you think your difficulty lies over here and mum or dad think it's, it's this entirely different kind of difficulty. Might that help us to start to think why it's been difficult to support you, why it's been difficult to understand what's going on? How does that feed into the maintaining loop around these difficulties? So. Um, capitalising on where there are discrepancies as well as building on the common ground is really built into the work we'll be thinking about in supervision to take back to the young person so that what that may help us to do is develop a much more systemically informed formulation of the difficulty that the young person is experiencing, starting to conceptualise where the vulnerabilities lie within that system as well as the protective factors. Um, by looking at these different perspectives. So really actively exploring that. So this material is brought every single week to supervision to go through in detail. And that again may start to help over time. At the, at the moment, um, the, the data set is very small. So there's very little that we can generalize out from, but over time as a team starting to think about which profiles may best match with um, what this, this um, approach to therapy might offer. Now this is where um, IPT has a complete home run and as, as easy, I think, probably relative to a number of the other modalities is that reviewing symptoms on a week-to-week -week basis is already what we were doing. Um, it's part of the model that you would have a symptom review. So it's always been there. It's the start of every single session. So as a fit, we've got it nice and easy. Um, where for other um, modalities, you may be looking more at how do we find space to build this in, this kind of discussion. And so whether it's a low mood symptom tracker or the PHQ-9 to track depressive symptoms, reviewing the role that depression's played in the week is, goes hand in hand. With, effectively, it's the, it's the IPT agenda. It's, the, it's as, as central to the process as that. Now, what we've done, and this is where Kate made me, me smile and made me think, that's good. We've been using sticky pads and having sheets of paper and doing interaction and things. So the form gets filled in, but then we try to do something much more collaborative with that. So something like this will be drawn out where there may be a weekly timeline that says, well, so where, where were the highs and lows? Where were the better and worse weeks? And, and to my mind, simply joining them up with a line starts to make it a story rather than data in some kind of abstract, confused form. So between the two of you, you made my day. And I was thinking, we're doing that, we're drawing pictures, we've got colours and they're on a piece of paper that we share. Well done us. 
Um, and so you start to translate that into the work in the session with the young person, but also that's what's, what's coming back to supervision and looking at them together and what does that story look like. So that collecting the, the, the scores over the weeks, when we get that in supervision, I'm, I as supervisor will be tracking what does that story look like. So I'll be tracking over the weeks as well, that, that line of say total scores on the PHQ. And, and my hope is that, well there, we've got an immediate opportunity to reinforce one of the key principles in, in CYPI app. That's, that's um, a, 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 a home run, as I say, for us. It helps us to illustrate where there's been progress, where it's starting to plateau, or where there may be setbacks. And so it's, it's very transparent in terms of when that's happening and we catch that very quickly in supervision by, by just following that journey. So if we do start to flatten out or we're seeing that change, immediately we can be thinking about well, what's happening there, what do we need to think about in the, in the way that this is working. It seems like it's going all right, but, but symptoms are staying the same. How do we make sense of that, that clinical impression um, and this information that's coming back? What it also gives us an opportunity to do is to apply some of the literature that's evaluated how we can predict who's going to make um, the best recovery using this model. So some of the published literature has, has, for example, told us that if you looked at a sample of young people who'd gone through IPTA and you looked at those who recovered, so had the result, had the endpoint that we wanted for them, we can track back and look at session four and compare what was happening in their scores at that point with where they were at the beginning. And they were, the, the, the literature tells us about a percentage reduction that we should be looking for at that stage. And so it becomes a, a bit meaningless in, in terms of, of the detail of it, but so it's a 16.2% um, reduction from baseline to session four, which Fortunately now all of the IPT trainees have virtually tattooed on their head and they're calculating like mad at session four. Are we on track for this? Because if we've got that, then we know something's happened. We know there's a movement that's, that's saying you are, you are on course, the trajectory is following what we would hope for the end point. And that's not a guarantee. You have to keep doing the work after that fact. But if you're not on that trajectory, we have to think at this point, we don't just let time go past and, and hope it improves. We have to think about what do we need to do now to improve that trajectory to get you on it. And there are various other studies, some of it extrapolating from the adult work, some of it with young people. So we're able to really actively use the information at this early point to maximise the chance of the outcomes that we want for these young people. And so monitoring that, actively applying the, the evidence base to the practice of the work. Um, and so my hope is that the, what that starts to do is also um, quantify and, and allow feedback to team members about the effectiveness of this. So you don't have to, as a team member, know all the nuances and details of the technique, but you need to know if it works and you need to hear about that in, in order for that to be a broader uh, um, responsibility to give pe young people access to this. Now the other thing, one of the things that haven't, hasn't been mentioned so far today, which is a different kind of outcome, but it's about outcomes in terms of developing a relationship and a working relationship in therapy. So the, the, the session rating scale, and again, IPT has the easiest of fits here because so much of it is about effective communication, thinking about how you get your point across, how you identify what you need, what you want, what you expect from another person, and how you find words to communicate about that and communicate it in a way that the other person can hear. So it's not just that you've said it, but you know that it's going to be received. And so the SRS, which is a very, very short measure, which effectively says, did you feel listened to? Are we talking about the right things? Is this approach matching for you? Um, is it giving you the ideas that you want? Is inviting the young person to practice exactly that kind of skill. Now, that the very fact that we ask, I think, is fantastic. The very fact that we ask, however, doesn't guarantee that you're going to get feedback. What a lot of um, the, the literature and feedback from young people will see is, that's excruciating. And I, I don't want to tell my, my therapist that they're not doing their job. Um, that feels too big a responsibility. I'd rather just lie. Um, and so there's a process of working as to how to make that meaningful. But there's an opportunity 
to practice this skill that we're, we're hoping for the young person to develop outside of therapy, but crucially importantly, it gives us a fantastic opportunity to show how powerful they can be when they take that chance. Because we've got a chance the next week to say, I'm going to do something different on the back of what you just told me. I'm going to show you the effectiveness of that. And my hope is that starts to create a very powerful reinforcing cycle there. So we're creating the kind of opportunity that you couldn't pay for in therapy to, to do that work. Um, and so then that provides really valuable material um, in supervision to think about that exchange. And it's, it's been quite a fascinating process because I'm hugely impressed by the quality of work and, and therapy that a lot of the therapists, who, in fact, all of the therapists who are on the course have been doing. And the, uh, one of the, the your, 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 your comment was lovely earlier on of saying, um, we, and, we, and the therapists thought they were doing this, and they thought they were doing a nice job, and all of my therapists were convinced that they had fantastic relationships with the young people, and they started using the SRS, and they didn't always get top scores. And it was deeply wounding. And so the first thing they was, so there's something wrong with this measure. Because I do have really good relationships with young people, and so it's because I'm in training, clearly I'm not doing the therapy I would ordinarily do, I'm not listening, and they're probably right, actually. They're not doing the therapy they would ordinarily do because they're trying to remember what's the next thing in the book and what's in my notes and what's my next task to do. But there was also just this moment of realisation, maybe, maybe I've been missing something. And maybe I've got an opportunity to work with the young person to make that better. And supervision can be an, an important place to, to hold and try and manage that and, and talk about that. So it's an odd, we get into an odd, an odd dynamic of um, trying not to get top scores at the beginning in order for there to be space to negotiate actually a meaningful relationship and then watch those scores improve and tolerate not aiming for, if the young person just told me everything's fine so I'll run with that even though I know it wasn't, and not to hide behind that. So um, building up that capacity to genuinely be curious and interested um, is there. Another, another way that we'll do that is that we use it in the supervisory relationship. So the supervisor puts themselves on the spot by saying, I'm going to ask you whether I've listened to you. I'm going to ask you whether we're talking about what you wanted to talk about whether we're working on a level that's understandable and giving you ideas. And so at the end of supervision, I'm asking for that feedback too. So that's an opportunity to model what you're asking therapists to do, to look at how you manage that, to tolerate and, and, and work with not getting top scores. <laughs> and saying, but do you know what? Really, at that point, I had no idea what I was talking about. And we both knew I had no idea what I was talking about. How do we, how do we deal with that? And, and, and so have an experiential learning opportunity within the supervisory relationship so that hopefully that transfers out. So you're, you've got these kind of levels of, of repetition going on. You're doing it in supervision, you're doing it with the young person, you're trying to get them to be able to do that in their, their, real, their real life with the rest of the relationship. So there's a number of levels in which that can work. Um, when it comes to evaluating outcomes, which I think is sometimes what ROMs can be reduced down to is that sense of there's a finishing line and did you cross it or not and it's, it, there's not really anything more than that. So hopefully what I've been saying suggests there's a lot more um, up until that point. But even with outcomes then I think centrally we would be using them as a, as a process as well as a final result. And so as I mentioned that graph that we would be following all through the week, are we, uh, across the weeks, are we on track to be getting to, to cross that, that final line and when do we pick up on setbacks or plateaus so that we're working with that as an, at an earlier point as we can. Cross-referencing different types of outcomes I think is very important to make that meaningful so as if, if you've got a sense which is perfectly reasonable in my view that this young person that I'm working with is more than a set of symptoms, then we should be gathering information about more than a set of symptoms. So what's, what's happening symptomatically? What's happening in social and relationship terms? What's happening in terms of the goals and, and the, the objectives you set for yourself? And how are they informing um, the work that we're doing? What's happening if you're moving ahead with your goals but your symptoms are staying the same or the opposite? 
How do we understand the relationship between these um, complex objectives that we've set for, for this relationship that we're, we're working on? And we'll use that information and, and, and those data towards the end, both to develop a maintenance plan, which is what have we seen to work that you need to keep doing? And so it becomes informed by the experience of the process of therapy. And also a relapse prevention plan, which is when your maintenance plan doesn't hold, how do we up the ante? How do we uh, um, make that more potent? And how do we catch that as quickly as possible? Um, what I've, in, in asking um, students who've been going out and trying to develop IPT within the services, one of the things that's repeatedly come back to me is that they've found that, that telling these clinical stories that, that are quantified but are in a, in a clinical and a, a young person's stories context is one of the most effective ways of engaging their peers and, and, and uh, fellow clinicians in thinking about this. So just talking about the techniques of a model, the phases, the strategies that you use or the evidence base gets you so far but, but relatively quickly into that conversation your colleagues are thinking about is it nearly time for a cup of tea or who brought biscuits today? Whereas if you've actually got this bound in a story with the young person and you can demonstrate that and you are showing what it does on the ground then that's the thing that starts to get people more interested. However, it does have to be repeated and so for most of the trainees that I've been working with, what they see is it takes probably about a year from a new modality being introduced in a service to it starting to be something that's kind of collectively held in the awareness of a team. But it's that repetition. And so some of that might be snapshots of updates of, of new um, of outcome for, for young people as new modalities are being introduced. This is where we've got to. This is how we've worked with this setback. So there are, if you like, installments on the story across the way, not simply just getting the end point of the story being told. And then once the numbers start to, to be gathered, we can start to summarise that. We can start to look at the, the impact of this modality for the population who come to that service and maybe the relative impact, again, feeding that back into care pathways. Um, in terms of just some of the problems, it can very easily, they just can get reduced to, to checklists that feel pointless, you described it earlier on, it's, it's information for somebody else, I'm not really going to use, why would you engage with that? And so thinking very much about how these tools can be integrated rather than added on to as an afterthought is a, is a core objective, I think, what we're trying to do in supervision. I'm keen not to make the questionnaires become a kind of jargon-filled script that, young, that, that therapists run through as well. So the number of times um, I've kind of heard first questions on PHQ of um, as you have kind of been depressed and hopeless, you know, this running through of terminology that you would, not the phrasing you would use. So actually being able to translate that, know what you're asking, but gather it in a systematic way with the ROMs, but not making that the therapeutic script because it, I think it can be uh, incredibly off-putting. Um, one of the, the difficulties I think we still have with the, with the ROMs that we use are that I think there are as yet very few um, flexible enough and broad enough measures of social functioning to balance out the picture. And so we do have some measures which either look at fa family relationships or look at friendships. Um, fortunately, most of the young people we work with have both. And what you don't want to do is end up with a huge stack of questionnaires in order to cover the range, but being able to think, well, what cross-referencing what information you gather, but what's going to be most pertinent in terms of tracking the outcomes that we want um, for you. And finally, I don't know if, I've, if there's time, but if there are any questions, um, I'm happy to take any. I'm not sure if we've got time or if we're doing that later. Um, I think we should press on. Thank you very much.